came around the different kind of, uh, sort of low carbon energy generation technologies that you might deploy at your business to give you a bit of a feel for the ins and out of each one and where they might be sort of applicable and perhaps you know a loose um, business case around those um, so throughout please post any questions um, via the chat function so if you um, go to the bottom there's a there's an option to post a um, chat in form of a text if you put your questions um, in that format and the speakers will pick them up as they go along or perhaps leave them to the end depending on if, that, if that's more appropriate because we will allow about five minutes at the end to have a have a q a session anyway so if you could do that and also just to remind you that uh, basically we'll be recording these sessions as well and putting them on our youtube channel so that any businesses that weren't able to attend will be able to to, to watch him at a later date so without further ado i will hand over to chris Atkinson from uh, Worcestershire County Council to talk about the various support mechanisms that are available. Thank you Simon. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to quickly um, talk about the funding available for renewable technologies for the low carbon operation uh, opportunities program. I'm involved in the business energy efficiency program and low carbon opportunities program from Worcestershire County Council. Um, I just want to provide you with a bit of um, wider context first. It's a, it's a really good time to be involved in sustainability and clean growth. There's a lot of funding and support available in the Worcestershire and the, and the Marchers, whether you're looking at energy efficiency advice um, or renewables, or even thinking more about biodiversity in, in, your, in your business. There's a lot of funding, there's a support out there, there's a list of opportunities down there. But there's also quite a lot of people involved as well. So it's, it's a, a good time. And it's a, it's a little bit of an ecosystem building up in Worcestershire and Herefordshire to sort of help you as, as well. Lots of, sort of businesses involved in this sector. Um, but we'll move on to talk particularly about the Low Carbon Opportunities Programme. Um, so this is a funding strand that's been going for three, three, three or four years. We're into the second phase now. Um, it provides businesses, um, SMEs in Worcestershire with free advice and grants to help um, them become, become, look at it renewable technologies, um, decide on, on the best re renewable technologies to install themselves and set, put together a, a business case um, involves two main aspects, which is free advice from our advisors. And we've got one of our advisors, jo John Wade from Bar Associates today to talk you through some of the particular various renewable technologies and also grants um, to help this become more, more affordable. And, and the grants, you know, they go up to £100,000 um, so you can make a significant difference and some big ins installations on the low carbon opportunities program uh, and the advice itself looking at the renewable um, opportunities is free and if we go on to the next slide please um, this is a little bit more information about these renewable energy assessments themselves um, often an underestimated part of the program but actually it helps businesses sort of benchmark and establish what they what they need what's the most appropriate renewable system for themselves, the advice is independent and free and actually puts businesses in a good position to make those decisions on how, how to spend the money. And we often get businesses at the end of the programme tell us that this part of the programme has actually been um, invaluable. Um, and then hopefully uh, they're in a good position to go on to apply for a grant. So the grants themselves, um, the technologies um, that we can fund in the renewable and energy generation part of the low cost program. Um, typically, we fund a lot of solar PV systems, but we'd also like to see a lot of biomass um, and, and ground source heat pumps, better use of heat. Um, and John will go on to talk a little bit more about those. Um, at this stage, it'd also be good to mention for anyone who's in Herefordshire, Shropshire, and Telford, um, Herefordshire Council run um, March's renewable program, which gives funding for low carbon projects. Um, similar to what we do on, on low cost, um, actually the more generous rate of 50%. So that's also um, worth looking into if you're in, in those areas. And moving on, um, the process itself is, is quite easy. Um, it's a simple process to register. There are eligibility, um, it is ERDS, we, we do assess those internally. Um, assuming you're eligible, we assign an energy advisor from Briar Associates to arrange a visit. Um, they'll work with you to provide you with a bespoke report to help you make that business case and then apply for a grant for the programme. 
So hopefully that's given you a very quick five minute um, whiz through of the low carbon opportunities programs on the renewable side of this. There are two elements of the low carbon opportunities program, but that is the renewable side of the program. If you've got any questions, please ask or contact me afterwards. I'll now pass on to John. He will talk a little bit more about the technologies themselves and how you can potentially use the grants. Morning, everybody. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that screen. Uh, as Chris said, my name is John Wade uh, from Briar. Um, we've been involved with Worcester County Council and Member of Commerce for a number of years now, helping them to deliver some of their uh, programs, uh, business energy efficiency program, and now the low cost program. Um, so I'm one of the advisors. So if you do apply, you may may well see my face coming to your premises to look at um, what systems we can um, suggest or recommend that you install. Um, my role here today is to basically give you an overview um, of what types of systems um, you should be looking at. So basically you may ask the question, you know, what are my renewable energy options and why should I invest? So I'm just going to give you a flavour, uh, some pros and cons and some sort of loose business cases for each of the kind of renewable options. Um, why are we doing it? Um, well, basically, you know, as we're all aware, climate change is kind of an evolving situation. Um, used to be called quite cosily global warming, which might have sounded like a good thing back in the day. Um, we more sort of hear the term climate change now, but that's kind of quickly moving into terms that create a bit more um, sort of drama in terms of climate crisis and climate emergency. Um, wildfires, flooding, all these things as, as a result of climate change and um, we need to act now to make sure that um, we're circumstances. Our UK government has set a fairly sort of challenging target in terms of achieving net carbon zero. They won't be able to do that on their own so they need some help from all of us in terms of investment in renewable technologies. Uh, and so we'll be looking at what options are available to us. So in terms of the different types of renewable energy technologies, uh, these are the kind of major ones. Solar PV is probably kind of one with the biggest uptake in terms of um, businesses, small businesses and even domestic. Uh, and so uh, Neil's going to go through that with you in a bit more detail after my presentation. My role here is to discuss the other options that you may have considered or you, you may, may not be aware of and just um, the, the various things are behind those. I'll also discuss uh, CHP which is kind of um, not essentially a renewable technology but has its place in the program maybe if we're looking at district works and there's also some at the moment very good financial incentives um, in terms of the CIP, which can help um, create funds for maybe other investment in, in sort of longer term payback renewable options. So we're gonna we're go, we're not really going to touch on hydro because that's not really something that's going to be accessible to to you as small businesses. But certainly we're going to touch on biomass. We're going to talk a little bit about wind which is kind of a little bit restricted in terms of, um, we'll come on to that. Uh, we'll talk about ground source heat thermal and then we'll... So, uh, firstly, biomass um, work, what is it? Um, biomass is basically the collective term for all plant and animal material, um, but we can use this and we can use kind of quite often waste materials generated to generate heat um, and it, even potentially electricity and to use as biofuel. Um, so where does the energy come from? Um, our biomass contains stored energy um, from photosynthesis in, in carbon-based life forms, which is then released 
when it's burned. So in terms of the business case for this, where would we typically use it? Um, I'm, most times we think about biomass, we think of um, sort of wood chip boilers, log burners, those kind of things. Um, and typically it's best suited for users that kind of have a continuous light or heat load. It's not um, something that is, it's getting better. It's in the past, you know, very good at being sort of a, uh, being applied to a, a, a heat load that varies a lot. So what you may well do with a biomass boiler is have it to or your base heat load and then maybe have a gas boiler to provide up periods where you may have much higher heat load such as the one. So typically it may be applied to, to businesses and, and operations that have a continuous heat load throughout the year. So that might be a high domestic hot water load in situations maybe um, hotels and things like that, uh, similarly with um, swimming pool environments. So, but well, it has been also applied in a, in a lot of school environments um, um, because biomass, again, is relatively, in terms of the fuel, it has been relatively cheap compared to gas. That's not necessarily a situation now, um, but because of uh, gas prices, down so much um so if you are considering biomass you should definitely check um with your local biomass suppliers uh, the, the availability of fuel in terms of wood chip or you may be burning or or and the, those fuels it may well be that um your business creates some waste in biomass that can be used um to fuel the biomass boiler so that so in that case it would definitely be more much more to consideration so if you're in a business waste wood or, or um in in a uh, kind of farming that has and that, then biomass boilers can be used um basically that fuel um uh your heat one thing you have to be quite careful of with, with biomass is um, there can be a, a logistical issue. They ne generally need much more space and the gas boiler you'll be replacing. So you should be sure that you've got enough room for the boiler. Um, you'll obviously need quite substantial fuel source because a uh, fuel store, sorry, um, because you're not just having the, the all piped in like you would with natural gas. Um, if you need large deliveries, you're going to have to make sure that there's access for lorries to come and deliver your biomass as well. So that's definitely got to be a consideration with biomass. They tend to have slightly higher maintenance costs as well than, than the uh, conventional gas-fired boilers um, because you're cleaning the weather where the biomass burns. And that's why we say we need to kind of generally try and keep biomass boilers operating more or less continuously because if the, if they're on a stop start basis then you can gash hardening and things like that. Be aware of that. Obviously we'll kind of if we come and visit you we'll look at the we'll give that. Uh, and we'll there are various funding options which we'll include in RHI obviously including low cop grants that are available now but we'll kind of those a little bit later on in the presentation uh moving on to wind um uh, you may not be surprised to learn that the uk is the windy you may be surprised but the uk is the windiest country in europe and um wind turbines produce currently over 20 percent of the uk's electricity uh, and generally, onshore wind is um, the cheapest form of all energy sources available because wind turbines um, have kind of relatively low operating costs compared to other renewable technologies. Um, and in view of that, the UK boasts two of the largest wind farms in Europe. The issue with, uh, in, in terms of on a, on a smaller scale, in terms of looking at uh, yourselves looking at wind turbines as a as a 
festival option or that there are horrendous planning restrictions. Um, so so the, the UK government has really made it quite difficult for, for you to consider wind turbines as part of your renewable energy options. Um, but if it's something that you are um, very keen to look further, then certainly, certainly look around those and you need to speak to the local authority about those restrictions. Uh, generally as well with wind turbines, um, smaller scale ones, um, if you are trying to install one without a grant, um, so we're talking to about sort of two and a half kilowatt um, peak electricity, um, they tend to have a, a payback that kind of outweighs the, the lifetime of the equipment, so not in terms of a financial investment rate. Um, good in terms of carbon from low carb, then that might may well be a viable financial option for you. Um, larger scale wind turbines are very good payback, but again, um, it's unlikely that you'd be able to get yourself past the planning restrictions there for a large scale wind turbine. But um, if you have a large amount of um, land, then again, that may well be an option for you. Large scale wind turbine is very good investment. But, um, Return. Um, moving on, and I apologise for whistling through these quite quickly, but again, if you've got any questions relating to any of the technology, other than um, the text box, we'll um, one that you kind of may be more familiar with um, are heat pumps. Now, probably the most uh, most People have come across this, this an air conditioning unit that you may have within your within your offices or your or your site. Um, but these can also operate in, as, as heating, um, as you may be aware. And they are, in fact, a very very efficient form of, of heating a building. I quite often go into sites where um, they have these units, and they're generally only using them for cooling in the summer. Um, because they, the, the um, condition is that um, using them for heating, be, they'll, they'll be a lot more costly. Um, modern heat pumps, even air-to-air -air heat pumps, operate typically with coefficients of performance of around about three to four, which means that for every kilowatt of electrical power that you put in systems, you're actually generating about four kilowatts of heat. Um, so if you compare that to a standalone electric heater, which where you put more kilowatt in, you get about one kilowatt out, um, obviously a much more energy efficient, cost effective way of producing heat. Um, I use them in terms of cost because of the low costs of gas at the moment compared to electricity where you, where you may on a site only have an electricity supply uh, then this is probably one of the most ways to to heat your building and by you obviously capital costs are substantially more than you pay for an electric um, but uh, what, with the the low cost grant uh, along with the energy saving you, you'll make back in the region of sort of five to eight years, uh, even less. Um, obviously, if you apply the grants, they come down to we're in the region of three to five years, uh, and depending on what you use these systems. Uh, if there are also more efficient systems in terms of if you look at if you've got enough space to install a ground source system, um, which would involve laying sort of a, a network of pipes in in a in a, a local sort of um, area to your building uh, beneath the ground. These are a lot more stable in terms of their efficiency because they use heat that is about one meter down in the ground is a fairly stable. 
a source of heat um, and operate more or less at continuous types of efficiency throughout the year, whereas air source heat pumps would actually hold the wood less efficient quite. Um, but you can provide heat via air conditioning units uh, or if you're using ground source, it provides low grade heat and then apply to floor heating and then often apply to windows and or radiators. The issue there is you couldn't just blindly necessarily go and replace your boiler with a ground source heat pump because they produce tends to be fairly low grade. It's like about 40 BC. So you may have to look at size, size, uh, uh, sizing your radiators, having a larger size radiators, uh, the low grade uh, effect bases. So in, in terms of the business case for heat pumps, typically uh, savings of around 50-55%, sometimes even greater. Ground source generally more costly to install than air source, um, but as we've, as we've stated, you generally have a higher coefficient performance, so um, you get a greater return on, on the investment, but still a longer payback than the initial capital cost. Um, Payback periods under five years for air source and under eight years for ground source. Um, we apply a grant to that, and obviously those figures come down significantly to in the region of three, three years and five years. Uh, next technology, uh, solar thermal, uh, which is is probably one again you you you're familiar with. These are uh, solar panels on the roof, um, different to PV in the uh, these aren't generating electricity, these are generating heat. So uh, basically, um, the panels utilize the sun's heat to produce hot water um, for domestic hot water or heating. Uh, these systems can operate all year round. And normally, there would be a need to supplement them with boiler. So you'd have these provide generally um, the sort of base heat um, or preheat. A domestic um, and basically the, the, the diagram there is just a pump um, it's usually a sort of a water glycosylate around on a separate water tank which would form the sort of primary source of the water tank and then if any additional heat was required to bring the system on to the required 63 C, then, then you would apply a, a, a top of the um, So, yeah, generally quite cost effective in terms of uh, the generation of heat, providing obviously light makes an appearance, which we can never guarantee in this community, unfortunately. Uh, moving on, combined heat and power. Um, now, Going back a few years, this was provided um, and was heavily invested in because it provided very good, um, we provided you with a very good reduction in your CO2 emissions and also generally um, was a very good financial investment. Fortunately, or fortunately, which, which depending on which way you look at it, um, because um, the uh, grid factor in terms of the carbon emissions on the grid have come down substantially over recent years. They've kind of more than halved in the last sort of five to seven years. It's not such, if we're looking at it as a kind of a carbon saving investment, not such an option um, because whilst the, electric, the grid factor of electricity, the emissions from electricity generated by the grid has come down substantially, obviously, the grid. To for burning for burning natural gas has stayed the same. So uh, the way these work basically is generally um, if you uh, buy your electric power station, power station is in fact is to all intents and purposes the same, same as a CHP engine, um, but they're only roughly in the region of thirty percent efficient. So a large proportion of the the energy. Um, that 
it, it's creating in, in electricity uh, power station is is lost through heat uh, and that's why we see these large sort of cooling towers um, and the steam towers and that's loss from generation um, so we we begin to get maybe sort of maybe forty percent power out of those with sixty percent losses. Having your own CHP engine on site means that if they're sized correctly and installed correctly, you can use up to about eighty percent of the the energy. Um, you'll still get some some waste heat, but your your engine will work at about a 30, 30 to 33, 35 percent efficient generating electricity. Um, and providing you size their size correctly, you can then utilize the waste heat to provide your um, heat for your building as well. Uh, as I said, the issue here is that because the, the electricity grid factor has come down to very near to the now, now the gas factor, and this is Earlier, a large amount of energy grid is now generated by wind turbines. Uh, and there's an element of nuclear. Uh, we've also got all the people that you'd be feeding back into the grid as well, some energy. So, so the risk factors come down considerably, uh, much closer to gas. So, a, a waste energy from your CHP plant, um, you're kind of we're. If you're using all the heat, um, then you're kind of about breaking even, maybe slightly reducing your carbon impact on the environment by using a CHP. Um, so the most significant opportunity for CHP is where the, the site has uh, a good base heat load and you should size your CHP to that base heat load so that you're using your uh, waste heat all the time and not just rejecting it like a power station would. Uh, uh, typically, it's used by organisation with a community demand. Um, just very quickly, and I um, will have to move on because it's my time. Typical electricity tariff is 15p and a typical gas tariff is and a half B. So you can kind of probably work out from there that if you're buying electricity off the grid at 15p um, and you're or you're using a gas CHP to um, create your electricity, um, if, even if it's only 30% efficient, if you multiply that gas figure by about by say three and a half, you're still at around about eight. P, which is kind of half the cost you would pay for your electricity. So it's still, in terms of a financial option, a very good investment. In terms of the funding options you've got for any of these technologies, um, obviously we've touched on the on these earlier uh, with Chris. Um, low COP grants uh, on burnt today, March's grants, um, forty percent or fifty percent of costs so these obviously bring um paybacks down considerably based based on what uh for these these systems um the real there are alternative options uh, and there are kind of local alternative loan options as well for, for various different technologies um the the government only really offers one option now um, and that is kind of has a limited shelf life, um, which, which is the renewable heat incentive, which is due, was originally due to end next March, but they've now extended it to the following March, um, which are basically payments based on a, a tariff table, uh, depending on the size of your technology and the amount, the amount it generates. Um, they're payments for the, for the amount of heat you generate in little hours multiplied by the tariff applied in the size of the technology and they're guaranteed for seven years um, but there are eligibility requirements surrounding those um, as well there's also uh, for electricity generating and i'm not sure neil will cover this in more more detail uh, for electricity generating technologies there's also our export guarantee which is basically um, 
agreed uh, in the supplier or um, any that is um, exported back to the grid. Um, this this is limited if you if you do go for a, a upfront capital investment grant, low cop you limited. On uh, you can you can export back to the grid. So the size you will be limited in terms of export, obviously because um, funding it's not. We just sell all the electricity onwards back to the um so that's basically the end of my presentation thanks for your time i'm sorry i've had to rush through it through it um but I'm on a limited time scale here but if you do have any questions then then please uh, i'll be pleased to answer them at the end thanks very much i think i'm now handing over to neil who's going to discuss pv with you in more detail Thank you, John. Let me just switch the presentation on. OK, has that come through for everybody? I've turned your faces off, so I can't see any nodding yet. I see a nod from John there. Thank you. So um, good morning all. My name's Neil Stott. I'm the Business Development Director for MyPower. We're a commercial uh, solar uh, designer and installer based in Gloucestershire. And our focus is, is primarily to help businesses reduce their energy costs and their carbon footprint. And I've been asked today to, to provide some uh, insights about how to start uh, a solar PV project and uh, also outline the benefits and some of the considerations uh, for this low uh, low cost uh, clean energy source. So just a little bit of background on us. Um, we've been in operation since 2010 and we've successfully installed over 13 megawatts, primarily rooftop. Some There is some ground mounted in there um, uh, over the last 10 years and uh, utilised over 50,000 panels. Um, some of the pitches on here you may or may not recognise there are a number of um, Worcestershire based businesses on there and also uh, an installation that we're very proud of uh, which is a, um, a 38 kilowatt uh, installation on Gloucester Cathedral so that's 150 panels on the, uh, the site there. Um, one of the things that our customers really value is the, our approach to sort of understanding their objectives and providing them with a clear view of the, the best options to meet their goals so that's where I'm going to start today. Um, very simply, um, the main drivers for looking at solar PV are typically cost reduction and reducing carbon footprint. Um, however, it can be it can be uh, useful to uh, support an ISO accreditation um, or, or any other sort of environmental uh, level of accreditation, uh, as well as making quite a visual statement to both your customers and, and your employees in terms of your uh, climate change uh, actions and, and so on but usually there's a um, there's a, a bedrock underpinning all of these goals which is which is on the commercial front so uh, our customers are typically looking to achieve a level of return of investment and that's what the um, from a finance point of view uh, our, our customers really uh, really look at and you've got a number of metrics there which are looking at sort of long or, or short term type returns so, uh, firstly, hopefully some of this stuff will be relatively straightforward for you, but why should you consider solar PV for your business? Um, first and foremost, it's, it's a clean energy source. Uh, hopefully, uh, you don't need uh, me to go into the detail of climate change. There are lots more qualified people out there who, uh, who deliver this message much more eloquently. Um, but it is a, a technology, a low carbon technology, which will help your business tackle climate change. The other element, as I mentioned, is, is the savings side of things. And um, PV, very simply, on a high level, um, I've heard John talk about sort of 15 pence per unit from the grid, a typical energy price. Uh, and typically, when you, you cost up your solar PV and electricity there, you're looking at about five pence per unit to generate. So as, as we, one of our strap lines is solar, it's clean, it's green, and it's a, a third of the price of grid supply. So there's quite a, an opportunity there to, uh, to save, save money for your business. Um, 
the other elements to consider are uh, and why PV is is a, a, a relatively straightforward choice is easy implementation um, relative to some of the other technologies out there. So typically, you don't require any sort of civil engineering uh, in the main. From a planning point of view, uh, uh, it's relatively straightforward, uh, even for the larger systems. Um, most most sort of uh, county councils now have, have declared climate emergencies and and we've yet to see a planning authority decline an application for a solar PV system on a commercial rooftop. Uh, essentially, it's a brownfield site, so we would be surprised if they were to, uh, they were to challenge that. Um, and another benefit really for solar PV is it's a, it's a low maintenance technology. So the, the, the panels are performance warranted for 25 years. There are no moving parts. Um, and at the end of those 20 or at that 25 year point, uh, the, the typical high performing panels are expected to be delivering about 80, 85% of, of their year one generation in that, that year, year 25 point. Uh, the other components, you've got your electrical wiring, taking the power from the roof uh, down to the inverters and it's the inverters that are doing the electrical heavy lifting. And again, typically will come with long uh, warranties sort of 10 year plus warranties on, on those uh, devices and again relative to the whole cost of the system they're easy to access and uh, and straightforward to replace and relatively speaking low in cost as well to do so so even if beyond that warranty point you do need to replace them it's not uh, it's not a huge expensive uh, uh, occurrence So um, what do we propose as sort of steps for a solar PV project? Well, the, the first one is really to, to, to get a, an idea of what you're looking at to uh, identify the best solution for your business. And, and, and that can be done in a very simple way and, and not very uh, time consuming. And that's quite important for us as a business, but also you as a customer that you're not spending a huge amount of time up front sort of doing this investigation. You can get to a point uh, very quickly with a budget desktop and this is where a PV specialist will be able to advise of the approximate size and scale and cost and give you some options for, for what would work for your business and your particular building. Um, it also helps us to understand what's commercially important to you. So going back to the points on the first slide um, around the design parameters, are you looking for a, a quick return on your investment or are you looking to maximise your your long-term return and that, that may well mean that it's a slightly longer longer initial payback period for the system but over time you're, you're going to get a much uh, much larger return and uh, your system typically when you go large will will make up a much uh, larger portion of your your energy supply so from this this desktop survey and having a good conversation with you about your site obviously uh, you will know your business and you'll know your building um, we'll, we'll get a, a good idea of what will work for you and can flag up uh, at that point as well any sort of initial risks or concerns. So for example, um, the, the, next, the next stage is looking at constraints and that can run in parallel and that may be a grid constraint. So for those not familiar, um, essentially your local network operator um, for example, Western Power will will assume that your solar PV system up on the uh, up on the roof uh, is going to push all of that power in the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer, out into the grid. So essentially, they need to uh, uh, assess and say, yes, the pipe work in your area can can handle that amount of output. Um, in the main, and I would say, given um, given uh, the sort of size and scale of systems, typically under the the grants process. Uh, there aren't usually um, uh, challenges or constraints there, but um, as we go out into the more rural areas, we do we do see uh, um, some of these factors coming in, and there are always ways of mitigating or working around some of the challenges presented with uh, grid limitations. Um, the other element to to have a look at is the structural side of things, and again, this this is a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, from a PV perspective, the um, most modern buildings are structurally suitable for PV. 
the panels are relatively light you're looking at about 20 kilos over about 1.8 square meters um, I would still recommend it um, to get a structural survey just to validate this and to validate the, the loadings on the roof the once we've kind of gone through those steps we've we've knocked on the head a number of uh, assumptions where we've got to the point where we understand what you're seeking to achieve um, and we've got some options for you which you can assess and and uh, we can then move forward into a sort of firm quotation stage and that final step is is then uh, a site survey where you come in and do the local assessment how how's the system going to connect into your into your actual supply um, what's the installation plan how will the where will the scaffold go where will the loading uh, bay go and um, in the vast majority of cases uh, there's minimal minimal disruption to a business uh, when when it's being installed most of the work is up on the roof uh, and there's a small uh, small amount of time which is planned uh, where we would uh, need to connect into your supply which takes the, the supply down for um, for a few hours and then the final part is is then looking at operations and maintenance uh, as i mentioned solar pv is a very low maintenance um, uh, technology uh, it really does depend on your environment so if you are uh, in a, an area frequented by seagulls, uh, then uh, you may look at either technology to help mitigate some of that, uh, some of the risk associated with that, and that may be panel level monitoring, um, or a proactive uh, maintenance program to come in and clean the, the panels on a re regular basis. But either either way, um, it's it's a it's a low cost solution and it's tailored to meet your particular requirements. So um, examples, um, this is really to highlight the fantastic opportunity with the grants uh, scheme. So um, obviously today uh, on the call, we're covering both the, the Worcestershire 40% grant and also the, the Marches um, region 50% uh, grant. So this is an installation that we did for a company called Edmo in ross on Y, 130 kilowatt peak system and um, as you can see they saved a significant amount of uh, funds there over forty thousand pounds on their installation um, with with a system that's going to generate quite a significant proportion of their energy needs they're quite a high energy user the system's going to generate just over one hundred and twenty thousand kilowatt hours of uh, electricity for them per annum and they're going to use quite a high portion of that on site because they're a, a six day a week operation and a, and a high consumer um, as you will see here the the equivalent purchase price the solar over over 25 years including the operations and maintenance um, is a fantastic rate without um, without the grant at 4.31 pence per kilowatt hour but when you factor in the the grant and the, the price drop into around forty thousand pounds then you're under three pence a unit uh, which is which is fantastic and the really positive thing here for solar and and uh, literally seeing this from the rooftops is uh, it is that the, the, the cost of the energy source coming in, the cost of fuel isn't going to change. It's free. It's the, it, it's the sunlight. It's been there for millions of years and it will continue to do so. Uh, we hope for a good few million years more. Um, and uh, therefore, you're not going to see any variability there. That's, that's, taken, that's, that's taken out in terms of future fuel costs. Payback, again, doing the simple calculations. And this is before any tax benefits, which I'm sure... Your accountants or FDs can uh, advise you on, um, but essentially um, around five years without the grant and, and under three years for your um, uh, with the, with the Marches grant there. And obviously the numbers are not too dissimilar with the Worcestershire grant too. Um, again, uh, you can see the numbers there: fantastic return on investment and um, a fantastic saving against that company's particular grid rate, which was just under 14 pence per kilowatt hour. Um, I've pulled together a fairly detailed slide just to sort of illustrate the point and really highlight the um, some of the key factors because I think it's, it's an important thing for people to understand. So um, at the top here, this is the system size. You've got the, the, the generation that we predict. Um, 
we've got software industry standard software which utilizes weather data over the past 10 years and also the technical data for the system that we're proposing uh, to to tell you what your system will generate over over a 12 month period and typically we found that to be very accurate if, if anything and i think it is because the, the world is heating up uh, it's proven to be on the conservative side so we've seen sort of two three four percent um uh on average sort of increase over that for the systems that we've been monitoring over the last few years so um this figure up at the top here that the annual generation is is uh, typically pretty accurate what you will see is variation on a day-to-day -day basis and on a month-to-month -month basis um but uh but those figures are, are accurate there um the one of the key metrics is the the on-site consumption so what we're taking here is uh, of this 120,000 units, 80% is used on site. And again, if you've got half hourly consumption data, we can accurately map this. Um, and this tells you how much of your grid supplied electricity at 13, 14 pence, you're going to displace with your solar electricity. So in this case, it's about 100,000 units. Um, and therefore you're gonna save uh, just under 14,000 per annum. So that's that's really key that you you try and establish as as high a rate as possible in terms of on-site use to maximise your uh, to maximise your saving. Uh, in terms of export, and you would need a, an export meter and a contract set up in in order to achieve this and to be able to sell to the grid. Um, we put in a rate of five pence per unit there, um, and any of the excess, so the twenty percent which is being exported to the grid. Or the 22,000 units is then being sold at five pence. Um, that rate goes up. Uh, the smart export guarantee will will, will help uh, stabilise that rate. But at the moment, that that rate's probably more more like uh, four pence per unit. That that sort of tracks the wholesale rate of electricity. But um, as you can see, it's much better to use the energy on site um, commercially than it is to export it to the grid. Um, that's that's the sort of hopefully explains the dynamic of using energy on site versus exporting to the grid and that's that's something that on the first stages when we're working through that with you we can establish what works for you and there are a number of factors that come into that which can be your your type of consumption are you four day a week five day a week do you operate at the weekends and things like that the the, the size of roofs that you've got available are, are all factors that come into that play um one of the uh one of the key things here that I wanted to share with you as well was around um, your your cost per unit. So you will have seen these units, um, the two two point eight six pence on the previous slide, and this is just a very simple illustration of how we get to that figure. So it's looking at what um, the the output um, of the system over twenty five years, the cost to maintain that system, and that's a uh, um, for any solar experts on the call, that's actually quite a high cost per kilowatt hour in terms of maintenance, but we, we factor that in um, to cover all of the potential associated costs there to give you an equivalent here, which is, in essence, we like to think of that as a forward buying your electricity, forward buying an input into your business. Uh, and as you can see, it's a very cost effective way of buying your energy uh, and to do it through that way. The last point uh, I want to make on here is um, obviously it's not they're not small sums of money that uh, we're talking about in terms of investing in a commercial system. It's quite a sizable grant available to um, um, to support your business. Uh, however, if the capital or capital is a factor in terms of not wanting to um, uh, uh, use your use up your capital within your business, then financing options and asset financing options are available. And, and again, these can prove to be quite an attractive option, especially uh, with, with a grant in place. So you can, uh, as you will see here, um, the savings uh, and, and, and income that you get from your system in the first year is about £14,000. Um, the cost of the, uh, the loan and paying back the capital and an interest is about £7,000. So net, uh, installing the system and financing it, you're, you're seven thousand pounds a year better off. So you're better off investing, borrowing somebody else's money to um, to install your system than you are 
doing nothing, which I think is a really, really powerful statement to make uh, for businesses because um, there's no planet B, there's no planet as, as outlined. So um, it's, a, it's a great way forward. So this brings me just on to, just to sum up really, um, starting a renewable project, my and, and our advice would be to establish what your focus is and, and in doing that is you get a pull together a, a, a budget es estimate from a specialist um, identify what sort of returns you're looking to achieve how much carbon you're looking to reduce and how much of your supply um, you're, uh, you're targeting to sort of reduce uh, and, and supply yeah, with your own electricity then identify any potential constraints which again um, a designer and installer will, will, will help you with whether that's grid constraints um, or other technical constraints on, on your site um, and then the next and final step is, is the sort of detail which is working, um, working up a plan to uh, minimise impact on your business and to uh, install, uh, ensure a successful installation. So solar PV from, uh, is a low cost form of electricity typically four to five pence per unit. The payback period is typically five to seven years. And, and please bear in mind that's on a technology that um, in most cases will outlast the length of uh, the, the lifetime of or lifespan of your roof. So they're warrantied for 25 years, the panels to perform at high level and will continue beyond that point. And typical return on investment is 15% is plus. And that's before all of these figures are, are, are before you, you go anywhere near a 40 to 50 percent grant. So the fact that um, uh, this funding has been made available is a really, really fantastic stimulus to drive carbon reduction and, and this low carbon technology. It's, it's a fantastic investment for businesses. Um, that's that's me. Thank you for your time. And if you do have any questions, um, please, please do ask. Thanks very much, Neil. If you uh, stop sharing your screen, then we'll uh, we'll take some questions. There's there's quite a few being posted actually. Um, uh, there was one around basically the limitations of buildings to support um, PV arrays. I, I'm assuming that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question because it will vary massively from building to building. But I don't know if you want to comment on that, Neil. Sorry, what was the the, the question? The um if you look on the uh the, the comments you can see see i can't it was quite early on um can't really find the exact word in <laughs> where is it so um i can't see the question i'm just sort of scrolling through here um i, I mean in, in terms of the restrictions obviously you've got you've got planning restrictions and we we install in um so firstly gloucester cathedral you're not going to get more um planning restrictions than say on gloucester cathedral it's a grade one star historic building um so i'd say from a planning point of view the it's much much more flexible than it than it used to be um, the second thing is mo most commercial buildings uh, and industrial parks. It's not it's not a factor, and it is a uh, it's a matter of process as opposed to a, a real risk on the application. Uh, when you get out into um, obviously the areas that we live in, lots of outstanding areas of natural beauty, then there are there are slightly higher uh, requirements in terms or, or more stringent rules for planning there. But again, it's a it's a case of following due process. So we've installed on a number of agricultural buildings within uh, area of outstanding natural beauty mm -hmm. and, and, and it, you just follow due process and, and it's, uh, we haven't had one rejected, uh, let's put it that way. Okay, great. And in terms of structural suitability, do you've come across many buildings where structurally they're not, they're just not sound enough? Um, no, where we find, no, in very simple answer there. Um, yes, you do go back to some of the older uh, steel frame buildings but then it's a, a question of uh, and then I'm talking turn of last century uh, type buildings Th that's where you, you definitely get the structural engineer in to advise um, where we do 
where we do um, uh, find some challenges is with some of the older agricultural type roofs, so uh, old fibre cement um, with asbestos in, in some of the older sort of farms and what have you. They're typically very brittle roofs, so on, on that front, normally would advise to overclad uh, and and, and if, if it's a type of building that would benefit from insulation that works quite well as well so we've done that before where we, we, uh, they would re renovate their building they would insulate it uh, with an overclad roof and and then we would install it on, on a new roof um, some some farmers it's it's on a on an old barn and it's not a factor for them it's a the, the roof doesn't need to be watertight etc etc and again but it's from our point of view it's you want the roof to be able to last as long as, as the panel so it's it, it it's a very quick one to pick up and it's done at that sort of budget stage where we can see the roof we get a good visual from google earth or the cus customer knows that they've got a, a 40 year old uh, fiber cement roof okay great um yeah and john there was a couple of questions around sort of particulates and air quality related to biomass uh, if anyone, if you'd like to comment on that, uh, yeah, it's it's been something that's been, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, floating around for a while now. There's been some government investigations into it, and um, uh, the the RHI put kind of some uh, restrictions on the the and so on and so forth. So, so there's been a, there's been, I mean, in terms of the majority of, of um, commercial biomass boiler manufacturers that that I mean I think this kind of applies more to where people are kind of just using stoves and burning logs and things like that which is causing the major impact because most most biomass boiler manufacturers have to do a kind of kind of um, regulation as regards to their emissions so um, I don't know I think it's it's kind of it's, it's something that there's investigations are going on into um but i think you'll find in terms of um i mean local authorities have, have nox emissions things um regulation as well which manufacturers comply with so i think there are there are the regulations there to to restrict okay. those issues okay thanks john you were, you were breaking up a little bit there so we um, we got bits of that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I think the point I'd make about biomass is, you know, it's still burning wood. It's like an old technology. It's, you know, it's probably not a longer term, low carbon technology, but maybe in, in some cases it's an interim technology. Um, and, you know, the government's put things in place about sustainable supply chain to try and make sure that emissions are recaptured. And that's not just, you know, imaginary. But, you know, I think in the, in the long, medium and longer term, you know, biomass is probably maybe not something that's going to be not in its current form um that's going to be widespread um yeah i believe duncan uh, duncan at x cool has got a uh, some insight you can potentially share you've been a recipient of a grant is that right duncan um yeah yeah um hello everybody um is it possible to share my screen if that's if that's possible with everybody um yeah i think we can sort that out that, that that'd be lovely yeah i just wanted to say that we've benefited from the, the um the consultancy assistance um and we've also just managed to secure in the last couple of weeks a uh, a grant of up to fifty thousand to um uh to develop our new thermal battery um now if i could possibly share my screen um then everybody should hopefully should hopefully be able to see that yep. and what we're developing as as x core is a is a thermal storage battery and the reason we're looking at this is to go um in conjunction with our heat pump so what what we're finding that especially with with wind turbines is is they actually get paid constraint payments to turn the wind turbines off so we're actually um we're actually missing the opportunity of harnessing energy when the wind blows and the grid doesn't need it so we're looking at a thermal battery um, that what we can do is we've also got a grant from the um, University of Birmingham who have done quite a lot of um, this type of phase change material so what we're actually doing is we're, we're running our heat pumps when the electricity price is very low during the night um, 
when the renewable is is um, the, the grid can't take the renewable energy, we're storing this in our renewable thermal battery, and then we're using the heat as as it demands for residential, stroke, commercial, um, and 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 other developments. So you can see that uh, this is a typical day. This was 30th of April. How how dramatically. The, the, the cost of energy varies. So by using the thermal storage, we can make use of a very low cost energy and store that energy to be used at a later time. And it might be something that, that um, I could discuss with Neil out of this meeting. So what we're doing now is we're developing this thermal battery that will, um, that will balance the, um, the grid to suit any overcapacity. We're obviously producing heat um, at, at a much lower cost than you would do using a standard heat pump. And one of the other things that we've been looking at with a couple of developers is also, is we can reduce the amount of boreholes and ground source because we can actually store the cooling to be used in a, in a commercial stroke retail development. So we can reduce the size of the capital plant as well. So it's certainly something that, that we've benefited hugely from, from the grant um, from the grant that we've been given and the business assist we've been given. So it, it's been a real sort of success story from our point of view. So um, it's, really, uh, it's really something we're, we're looking forward to progressing. So that was a low cop uh, technology development, uh, innovation grant, was it? Is that? It, it was, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, we got both. We, we got the business assist and we got the um, low cop energy, um, energy grant to develop our, our thermal renewable battery which we, okay, we, we, we should hopefully be in about the position of about six to nine months be, be able to sort of that will be on the commercial market so so what kind of a scale of energy storage does it have or is it completely scalable from domestic to large commercial or? we would say uh, i mean at the moment we um we manufacture packaged heat pumps from about 200 kilowatts up to the largest one we've done which is about four megawatts so just to give you a, a rough example in the residential market that would be probably 50 flats 25 houses up to about a thousand flats 500 houses um, because we see this and particularly interesting you were talking about chp um john the the new draft london plan doesn't look very favorable on chp and um if they if chp is not accepted under the um the greater london authority then people have very limited options of where to go to. So yeah, heat I, pumps will be... I think you're right. CHP is very much a short term, in terms of probably in, 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 uh, certainly in terms of long term um, carbon neutrality. It's, it's, it's not great. It's obviously burning gas. Which we, well, I mean, obviously, and, and, and sort of CHP fuel cells and things like that. I think CHP will develop not in the current form that the majority of CHPs are with gas turbine engines. So, yeah, it should look on a different view for CHP in terms of at the moment, but certainly not. We're not we're not getting much of this, John. We're... Really? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Duncan, for that. That's, that's really interesting. Um, if you could unshare your, your screen. Um, has anybody else got any questions? Because I'm conscious we're running, running over time now and people might have to go on to other things. Any other questions? I just saw, I mean, it, I, I see one of the questions around the, the variations between the peak summer months and winter. Um, and, and just really uh, Duncan's point there around the storage technology and being able to move move to time of need is quite is is definitely a an important factor going forward as we bring more renewables onto the grid so uh talked about uh, the grid becoming cleaner and that's that's driven uh driven by wind and and by and by solar um but obviously they're they're variable like when the sun's shining and when the wind's blowing um so we we've got we've got to and this is where centrally it needs to be sort of funded and and driven we've got to get the infrastructure there so rather than having this huge sort of macro generation network and huge power stations um, we've, we've got lots of micro generation 
um, and it's this sort of local storage which will which will really really help that help enable that and help that happen and it will help businesses to use more of what they generate uh, on site and, and not just sort of pump it pump it into the grid so the, the storage technology and that development there um, is really really important so what are you, just to put it into context would, would you say something like 20 or 30 percent of the peak output in the winter compared to the summer is, is that the kind of uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, cloud, it's, cloudy, it's, horrible day. It's certain. It's like a bell curve through through the year, yeah. and a bell curve through the day is is yeah. the way of describing it. Um, but y you are still producing some quite significant um, generation off your your large large systems in in the winter, um, and it, it's sort of myth busting. We 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 do that sometimes. We look at things like uh, oh, I've I've not got a south facing roof. Well, actually, if you've got an east-west facing roof, that, that can work better sometimes because you don't get necessarily get the, the, the higher peak in the middle of the day, but you get more energy in the morning and more energy in the evening. So therefore, you've got more usable power for your business. Um, and things like a north-facing roof, yes, you do. As long as you haven't got a ridiculously steep pitch, you will still get generation and, and a good level of generation from your north-facing pitch. Um, it comes down to your particular circumstances and you do the numbers, you do the maths and say, does this work for me? And if you're a high energy consumer and you've got a north facing roof, then it probably it probably will do and make sense there. OK, uh, there's a question from Jason French actually about um, whether the grants are applicable to uh, retrofit or new build. Uh, so basically, they're generally um, existing properties only. They're not they're not for new developments i think that's right isn't it chris yeah just to sort of add to that generally speaking we, we can't fund things that have to do with um, planning regulations or um, building regs or, or things that could conform to what you what you can do so, so generally most of our grants are for things that have been retrofitted helping businesses with existing energy need i mean we, we, if you've got particular examples and you want to discuss them we, we can sort of have a conversation to see if, if, it's, if it's possible um, like with, I've, got, I've got development clients who, who, who are into development and not only in terms of the solar panels, but also if you're looking at a uh, multi, multi house development site, you know, the ground source stuff that Duncan was just talking about could be of interest if, if there's some incentives. Perhaps we can pick that up outside of the meeting, um, Jason, if that's okay. Uh, where people are moving into an, you know, a not a new property, but a new to the business property. So if they're moving into a new site, um, they can be applicable then because there's obviously there's already an existing building with existing uh, mechanical and electrical equipment that we can basically use as a baseline to then, you know, retrofit something onto. So it, if it's an existing property that somebody's moving into that, that can potentially be applicable there. But if, it, if it's a complete new build, then, you know, we're not, they're not, they don't apply, unfortunately. All right. Is there any other questions? Um, you know, we're sort of 10 minutes or so over time. So I'm conscious of letting people get on with their day. Anything else on the, the written questions? Hey, there's a question about hydropower. Um, Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we can't, we've not been able to get every, every technology in there because there's like fuel cells as well that we could probably have talked about and hydro, but you know, just limited by time, we, we sort of concentrate on the most common common ones but yeah chris any any sort of comment about hydropower is is potentially applicable isn't it for uh, um local? yeah we we've, we've got an energy strategy for the county um that's been implemented by alex person at the worcestershire lep um that that would probably be a good starting point to have a conversation with with alex and, and see if we can move forward on that uh, and there was a question here about the battery inverter i'm not sure if that was related to a specific um, thing that Neil mentioned was it or or was this to do with what Stephen was talking about I'm not quite sure um solar oh, so that was related to the solar so w w was it the project you flagged up as the example uh, I think that's what it means what size was the inverter there um oh I'd have to have a look um I, I would guess probably about you probably got about 100 100 kilowatts of inverter uh, maybe 120 on that, that that system. I can't I can't recall off the top of my head. 
Uh, what, what was the, I, I'd ask the sort of, what's the sort of driver behind, because it says uh, size of the energy sort of battery slope, stroke inverter, what, what's the, the driver behind that? Uh, it was Stephen Taylor, isn't it? I think we, we should be able to unmute you, Stephen, um, if we can find you. Uh, uh, are you on a Stephen? And there's a Stephen and there's a Stephen Taylor. Um, oh, here we are, found you. Can we, un can we unmute Stephen Taylor? Yep, okay, we should be able to hear you now, Stephen. No, not getting anything. Uh, so for the for the cathedral, uh, so the size of the system in terms of panels there, it was a 38 kilowatt peak. Um, and again, that's most likely going to be a 30 kilowatt in inverter on, on, on there. So so you've got um, your panels are the, the maximum output. Uh, uh, so at, that's what they're rated at in lab conditions and so on. So that's where you get the size of 30, 38 kilowatt peak. So your panels when you buy a, a solar panel on its own um, you may be looking at say a 355 watt panel that's what it will produce at its maximum peak uh, in terms of the inverter and what you size to there um, you, you typically the, the the size of the inverter or inverters is slightly less that, than than uh, the, the overall panel size right thanks very much well thanks for all the questions um, and then unless there's any others, I think we'll we'll bring it to a close now. So thanks very much for attending. Um, basically, we'll probably have another another one sort of um, September, early October. We'll probably be our, our next forum, but we we've not actually uh, finalised that one yet. Um, so I'm going to ask a quick question about who to speak to. Uh, um, oh yeah, Alex, Alex P Pearson. Um, yeah, we can send send you his details, Rebecca. Um, we can forward those to you. Um, let me just make a note of that so I don't forget. Rebecca Neal. Also, hi, it's Adrian here. Um, also, Tim Yeah. Okay, yep. Uh, yeah, can he, 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 he covers the Marches area, so if, if you're, I'm not sure where you're based, Rebecca. All oh, right. But I'll, I'll, we'll pass on those details. I'm sure he can still stick his oar in. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks very much, and um, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, everybody.